Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is time for lights, camera, and time for us to take action as we welcome you to tonight's speaker series program, Harnessing the Power of Documentary Films for Social Change. Hi, everyone. I'm Kenny Blank, and on behalf of the family and the Foundation's Board of Directors, it's a pleasure to welcome you to what we think is going to be a very special speaker series program tonight. First of all, we are thrilled to have with us the senior team from Participant Media, a leading producer of films that inspire social change and educate audiences on the critical issues of our time. Founded by entrepreneur Jeff Skoll, Participant Media has produced more than 80 films, 56 of which, of which have been nominated for Academy Awards. CEO David Lundy and Chief Impact Officer Holly Gordon represent the leading edge of creative media, and they are here to share their expertise tonight with us on what it takes to produce exceptional programming, programming of the highest caliber, and what is required to turn film into fuel for action. Moderating tonight's conversation will be Pat Mitchell, who runs her own media empire from here in Atlanta. Among other posts, Pat is on the Skoll Fund Board of Directors, and she chairs the Sundance Institute Board. Tonight's conversation comes against the backdrop of remarkable growth in Georgia's film industry. I don't have to tell most of you here that. It's been 10 years since the state adopted the tax incentives that have brought Hollywood's biggest productions to our town. Georgia is the number one filming location in the world for movies. As it relates specifically to documentaries, Georgia was recently featured in the award-winning film Released, which spotlights programs aimed at helping ex-inmates gain successful employment. Among the solutions promoted in that film, Westside Works, an innovative job training program piloted by the Blank Foundation. There have been over 50 showings of this documentary statewide, and each screening represents another chance for funders and nonprofits to learn how they might replicate the success of Westside Works in their community. This brings me to the second reason tonight I think is very special. I'm pleased to announce that the Blank Foundation and Participant Media have joined together to launch a new program that will help train Georgia nonprofits on how to use documentaries to heighten the impact of their work in the areas of social justice and racial and economic equality. Yeah, that is worth a little round of applause. And joining the foundation and participant in this uh, partnership is Working Films, a nonprofit dedicated to enhancing film-based community engagement efforts. You'll hear more tonight from Anna Lee and Molly Murphy of Working Films about how they'll mobilize grassroots organizations to advance their mission and extend their reach through documentary, and how both organizations and funders can participate in this new initiative that we're announcing here tonight. Like most foundations here, the Blank Foundation does not generally make direct grants for uh, film production, for documentary film production. Until now, our investment has primarily taken the form of the Blank Foundation film series. A few quick examples, a screening of the film Newtown about the Sandy Hook shootings. That included the dialogue of interfaith, uh, interfaith groups and their efforts to stem gun violence. And we partnered with the filmmakers of King in the Wilderness to create turnkey lesson plans that impart Dr. King's values to high school students across the country. Now, through our, part, uh, through our partnership with Participant and Working Films, we hope to see more funders and nonprofits deploy documentary as a tool to educate and advocate. We are rising to meet a challenge that was first poised by my dad who was attending a national conference a couple of years ago and heard Jeff Skoll speak on how documentary film can affect change. So my thanks to my dad and Jeff for providing the spark for tonight. And now before we begin our conversation, let's take a brief look at the work of participant, me of participant media and the power of a good story. Thank you.
You see that dot? It's our only home. What is it that has brought this big family of strangers together? Arts is about opening up to possibility. Possibility links to hope. We did it because our common suffering and love for each other kept us together. I'm not attacking free speech. I've been defending it against someone who wanted to abuse it. The New York Times was barred from publishing any more classified documents dealing with the Vietnam War. What's next? The way they lied, those days have to be over. I am here because I care. We're going to tell this story. We're going to tell it right. It could have been you. It could have been me. It could have been any of us. All I ask of our brethren is that they take their feet off our necks. Most of these systems are relatively easy for a sophisticated hacker. There have been assassinations of nuclear scientists. Some human assets had to be involved. Spies. This is not a question of somebody skulking around in the shadows. These are everybody's issues. We see what happens in other parts of the world, and, and we just always think that never can be me. It already is you. One of those animals was carrying a dangerous pathogen. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. That's where we're headed. I always feel hopeful that we can do the right thing. It is right to save humanity. It is wrong to pollute this earth. It is right to give hope to the future generation. Who is it that I aspire to be? That is the question that we should be asking ourselves all the time. I am those 66 million girls who are deprived of education. We are stepped out upon the world stage now with the fate of human dignity in our hands. Now, now, now. And the Oscar goes to... An Inconvenient Truth. The Code, Citizen Four. Spotlight. A fantastic woman. It's easy sometimes to feel like you're powerless. But I'm here to tell you today, you are powerful. And you know that there are people like you who are ready to act. Let's create a community of people that are talking about life's big questions. We know that we're right to do this work. And they don't need no leader telling them what to do. Because we're all leaders. Wow. I, and no matter how many times I see that real, I am almost in tears and with goosebumps and all the things that come with feeling what a privilege it is to have these two people in our room this evening and to be in this room in particular where so many of you are involved and engaged in exactly the kind of work that these films um, point out and raise awareness about and tell stories about. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you, Penny and John and Kenny, for inviting me to be a part of this evening. I've been a part of the participant story for a long time, actually since Jeff opened the doors and he called me at PBS and said, I have this really crazy idea. <laughs> I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to create a movie company that doesn't have to make money. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> that was only the beginning of Jeff's vision. And I was thinking about it tonight, coming to this place where so much good happens, that people who start foundations, like Arthur Blank, have a vision. They have an idea. They have a mission. I think in, in Arthur's case, as I read it and look at the work, it was about transforming individual lives, making sure that the next generation was prepared to lead this country and this world where it needs to go. And I think of Andrew Carnegie, who used his talents and his capital to build libraries. 
uh, Bill Gates who set off to cure malaria along with other things. So people who have resources, capital, talent, and at some point in their successful careers decide they want to give back in a very special way. And that happened to Jeff Skoll when he was president of eBay and sold the company and at a very young age to be setting this direction mm -hmm. in his life decided to create a foundation, the Skoll Fund and the Skoll Foundation, and to create participant media. And David is now the caretaker, the leader, and I must say um, exceptionally effective in the years that he has been leading this company. Participant has exponentially uh, reached new goals and has built on new ambitions. So David's uh, a very impressive biography is in your program. It would take me quite a long time to tell you all the many things that he has done, but he came to participant as a very seasoned producer and executive having run Universal Pictures, Focus Features, just a few little small companies mm -hmm. like that. Uh, between them, he's, I think he's had over 100 Oscar nominations. Wow. This one person sitting here. And beyond this exceptional talent and uh, an eye for talent and understanding story and how to tell it, um, David really is an incredible leader. And on behalf of Jeff and everyone who gets the privilege to work with you, David, it's a joy to watch this evolve. Thank you. So as you think of yourself as the current caretaker of this vision, how do you interpret what Jeff set out to do and 2018 for participant media? Well, I, I think it, it's, it's almost not an accident that it's, the company will be 15 years old next year, which is a, it's a, which is a real milestone, in, both in terms of numbers, but also in terms of where the company is. But you know, Jeff, from a very young age, believed in the movies, and he believed in telling stories, and he believed in, in storytellers. And he believed in it so much that he began to express express that in a very, very cogent and I think very visionary way in, in that he was he had the foresight to see that great storytellers were more often than not um, thinking about and identifying what was most likely about to become in the zeitgeist of, of our culture and our times, right? And that artists specifically have that ability to almost literally foresee what is gonna become most important to us. And I think the amazing thing about what Jeff did was he also foresaw something that, that nobody foresaw, which is the uh, emergence of the millennials, right? And we're, we, are, we are undergoing, and you know, we can throw a ton of data out at everybody, and most of you probably know all about it, but you know, there's something going on in the culture and there's something going on in the zeitgeist of, of millennial culture, which is that millennials are looking differently at the way they spend their money, right? And you're talking about uh, a, uh, a generation of people who have $44 billion worth of buying power in the consumer marketplace, and they are, they are demanding and asking for a different kind of engagement from brands, from corporations, and also from filmmakers, quite honestly. And they're identifying a different way of valuing the way that they spend their dollar. And I don't know that Jeff you know, predicted the age of the millennials 15 years ago, but that's our audience. And that is the audience for all the filmmakers and the people here who are involved in documentaries, is this is a really a, this is a zeitgeist moment, right? When when the power of, of story, you see it everywhere. You know, you see it in um, advertisements by State Farm last year who did that fantastic um, uh, One Forward campaign, right? So you see it in advertising, you see it in movies. And the reality of the matter is that what's wonderful about, about films and documentaries and things like that is they can literally be seen by millions of people, right? And they can be seen by millions of people in a, very, in a relatively short time. Um, we just had an experience that was incredibly exhilarating in a, a documentary that we were involved with called RBG, um, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg documentary, which had a, which had, which had a spectacular um, performance in theaters uh, um, 
uh, I think it's grossed fourteen and a half million dollars or something like that, uh, which is spectacular for a documentary. But did something that's quite unusual in that it had been produced by CNN Films along with Participant, and so it actually arrived on CNN relatively quickly. And in its first airing um, earlier in September, right after Labor Day weekend, 2.7 million people saw it on one day, on a Sunday at 9 o'clock at night across this country. So literally, you're talking about a story that is about something that we know is incredibly inspirational, that leads people to want to engage in their community and engage in the important conversation that's going on. And you've captured them. You've captured over 4 million people in the course of, of four months. And that ability for a story to engage people and to lead them to a conversation that they feel is important and to want to actually engage in that conversation and do something about it is pretty unique to, to the kind of content that we hope to create and, and create as often as we can. So. And when you look at that, um, that reel this evening and you see so many of these iconic films, each of which was probably produced in an atmosphere of, well, is anybody really going to care about that story? Mm -hmm. And we hear that in spite of this change in this next generation, which you're so right to mm -hmm. point out, David. But in spite of that, you, you often, particularly around documentaries, would get, no one's really going to go and see that. It's too painful. It's too sad. It's too difficult. And looking at the evolution of documentary and narrative films, and the issues that Participant has taken on. How do you define where we are now, where Participant is now, in terms of the story choices that it makes for documentary and narrative? Well, you know, that we, we believe very strongly in a, in a sort of a, a mantra within the company, which is if nobody sees your movie, then there isn't going to be any social impact. Um, uh, um, so we are, and, you know, Jeff has been amazing not only in providing us sort of the, the, the North Star for everybody in the company to, to, uh, to follow, but obviously funding the company itself. And, and so it's, uh, I think where we are is we've, we are a company that, and I hope this answers your question, but uh, we're a company that believes in the longe longevity of the people who work at the company, right? And one of the things that's really key to what it is that we do is that the people who run what we call narrative film and documentary film and television have both been with the, with the company for over 12 years, right? And so they've developed a cadence within their organization of, of thinking about issue, of thinking about where, where issues are going, in engaging in filmmakers in, in dialogue that really builds toward a, a consensus of, we think this is gonna be important, right? And especially in documentaries, you're really rolling the dice, right? And the, the documentaries that we, that we make tend to take about three years to make from, uh, from green light to release. And Diane Weirman, who runs documentaries and has won Academy Awards, and uh, is, she's just somehow or another, and Pat's known her for a year longer than I've known her, but she's got her pulse on something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? But I really do think it's also about, you know, one of the things that I think is important is it's, it's vital when you go into make, because we have lots of documentaries that barely see the light of day, mm -hmm. right? for whatever reason, right? We miss the, we miss the moment. Um, uh, they're not very good, you know? These are, making, uh, making art is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but we try to go into it with expectations, right? That, that can appreciate great success, but can also appreciate commercial failure, right? And we try very, very hard to think about how can we, how can, how can we actually engage no matter what, right? And I think that that's for, for you know, in, in, when you look at documentary filmmaking specifically, right, having a clear idea and thinking ahead to these are the kinds of organizations I would like to partner with, right? Whether they are impact organizations on the ground or they're distribution organizations. These are the people who I think are most suited to this piece of content that I'm going to create so that as you progress towards the completion of the, of the film, you're actually beginning to engage at that level, right? Mm -hmm. And so one of, the, one of the things that I've learned from you know, my many years in the film business is once you engage with somebody over a piece of content, right, especially when it's not finished yet, 
you create enthusiasm, right? And you create engagement, and you create passion and enthusiasm. And sometimes that can overcome the movie maybe not being so great, right? And, uh, and so that's, that's, you know, that, that's how we kind of do it. That's how we, we like to think of it. We like to think of it as, you know, hopefully we'll get there, but if we don't, what are we gonna do? So. Well, I'm not going to ask you to name the ones that you. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I, can, I can actually, I can actually tell you, tell you one. You know, which was a great success for us is, we made a movie uh, last year that Ai Weiwei, the Chinese artist, uh, directed called um, uh, uh, Human Flow, which is about the global refugee crisis, and um, was a commercial disappointment. And I, you know, I guess. I'm actually being taped, aren't I? But, um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it didn't. It didn't, and for for reasons that I can explain. But but it's uh, it didn't it didn't have the box office that we anticipated that it would have, right? Um, it didn't quite reach the level of, of of overt consumer awareness that we thought it would, right? But it actually wildly overperformed in other areas, including on Amazon, on airplanes. It was released theatrically in 30 countries around the world, um, uh, which is almost unheard of for, for a documentary. Um, and I credit that to the people who were working on the film. They believe it's a beautiful, beautiful film, right? It didn't capture an American audience so what they did, and in theaters. So what they did was they said, OK, it's not just about theaters. Mm -hmm. It's about how can we promote it on Amazon, right? How can we engage the organizations that are working on, uh, on uh, around the, the, the refugee crisis to spread the word, to talk about it? And ultimately, you know, the fact that that film was released, and I credit the people who work for me, that film was released in French theaters, right? In commercial theaters in France, right, with a lot of hoopla, and Ai Weiwei went, and that is the one country where it, that message needed to, be, needed to be said. It needed to be talked about. It needed to be conversed about. It needed to be in newspapers, in magazines, in theaters, on TV, everywhere. And the people that we worked with on the film executed on it. And so it ended up being a success. And inner Holly Gordon. Mm -hmm. who may be the only person in the room who has the title Chief Impact Officer. <laughs> Anybody else have that title? Maybe, maybe in this room there are yeah, other there people are some chief impact who have that. But, well, but soon, that, soon there will be. <laughs> and, and, and Holly wasn't there during Human Flow. She's recently come to participant. Um, a great joy on our part to attract someone who has um, the track record that Holly has in creating impact campaigns around films. You may remember an extraordinary film called Girls Rising. And from that campaign, uh, Holly created something quite still the, a gold standard for global impact and an organization that continues. Into this ecosystem that David described, and which has become so much a part of, well, it is the ultimate mission mm -hmm. of participant that we tell the stories that do have social impact and that do compelling stories to compel change. There are the people who make the content, mm -hmm. the producers who work for participant. There are the distribution companies that we make partnerships with to distribute the films. Then there, of course, is the audience who we hope go and see them, but also very critical in there are the chief impact officers, the people <laughs> who are looking at that story and saying, how do we create the kinds of campaigns? And in that ecosystem is where foundations mm -hmm. like the Blank Foundation and others have stepped in as partners. But how do you think of that ecosystem and where your role is? Well, it's funny you said when you watch the sizzle reel, you always uh, get tearful. And every time I watch it, I am overwhelmed by both the privilege and also the incredible opportunity um, and um, responsibility of being in a position to take some of this world-class content uh, and make change with it. Um, and so, um, you know, when I, 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 uh, uh, because this is one of the mandates that David has brought um, into the company, um, I participate in the green light process. So we start to think about impact before we've made a decision about whether or not we're going to support a film. 
um, Jeff did come in with a, a, um, a willingness to um, put a deep investment in creating this content, but he does want the content to be commercially viable and to be sustainable, and that's a really effective lens on making sure that we're making entertaining content that hopefully will find an audience. Um, and so even as I have, I have enormous trust in my colleagues, you know, Jonathan and mm -hmm. Diane and David, and who on the content side, that's their job to make it great. Um, and my job is to really try to think about how to make a difference. And the way we make a difference is always relational. So it is always through the work of other people who we are never an expert in any space and on any issue area. We are never um, experts. We are storytellers. And it turns out that often the experts in the issue area are not experts in storytelling. So it's an incredibly natural relationship that we build. And my job is to figure out how do we leverage the significant financial investment that has been made on the part of the participant, you know, uh, budgets in the millions on these films, sometimes in the many millions. What is the leverage that, what leverage can we apply? How can we get to points of inflection, points of power, points of scale that can actually take that investment and um, and make a difference at scale. Um, and it's always through leaders. It's through leaders in foundations who've been working on this, um, these issue areas um, for many years. It's through the leaders of the nonprofit organizations that are working in communities every day on the front line. Um, and it's also in, um, in, in um, relationship with individual citizens. Um, you know, at the core of our mission is this idea that every citizen has the power to be a change maker. And what you see in our films again and again are narratives about ordinary people with extraordinary courage who stand up and speak truth to power, who say this is unjust. You, you saw Malala um, in that clip. She's a perfect example of a, of, a, of a participant film. Lincoln, President Lincoln, right? There's a narrative film, a leader who stood up and said, this is wrong, we're going to do something different. Love him or hate him, Edward Snowden. And so there's this storyline, and I would suggest that our through line of our content about leaders is also our through line of our impact audience. So we're looking for our audience of leaders with whom we can partner and say, hey guys, we just invested millions of dollars in this piece of content. Use it to accelerate the reach and impact of your work. Go for it. And how can we help you do this? How can we help you think it through? Thinking of impact um, like a supply chain, really. I mean, beginning with an idea to make a difference and getting to the point where you can actually measure change. Mm -hmm. One of the hardest One of things the hardest to do. Things. And foundation people know that very deeply, how hard it is to measure the impact of our work. You're looking at it. Where, where's the weakest link in this supply chain? The weakest link is really the transaction from film to action. Um, still, uh, one of the reasons that we're so excited to be partnering with Blank Foundation on this initiative is because it's really a pilot to try to make more robust the relationship between the moment of inspiration, the moment of power of the content, and the individuals working in the field on the, on the issue area. Um, we have an incredible um, opportunity with, uh, with digital tools to shorten that gap. Um, I really think of it as um, the marriage of um, content creating is great storytelling and community organizing. And so if we can do, if we can get better at community organizing ourselves or partnering with those and understanding the principles of core community organizing, that's when you start to really, you end up with a scale tool in the hands of community organizers, you know, you're off to the races. So that's really investment in that community organizing piece with this understanding that, you know, corporations wouldn't be paying for advertising if storytelling didn't move people to do different things. And so, but we shy away from it from the, in the not-for-profit space. We don't think about it, the, you know, the power of story to actually move the needle on our issues. And so I'd like to see more investment, yes, in the content creation side, but also in this particular expertise that's impact producing, which is the relationship between the content and the and communities. And David, how do you think about that when you're sitting at that green light table with your, your content executives and um, somebody said, this, this film's going to change minds, it's going to change policy, um, it's going to change the way people look at the refugee communities around the, the world. How do, what, what triggers the, 
the green light for you? Well, I think at, at the company, you know, first of all, it's not a, it's not a particularly big company, um, uh, although it's full of very creative, very intelligent, and, and, and very, very committed people. But so, and we make a lot of content. I mean, we make um, uh, largely because we believe that that we're, without scale, we don't get distribution, and without distribution, we don't get we don't get impact. So, um, the way we every the, our, the way we break it down is that everything that we should do that we do should be about a conversation, right? So, and we start with a place of, okay, is there is this addressing a conversation that people are going to deem important to actually engage in that conversation itself? So. You know, we, we make movies that there may not be an overt social impact campaign about, but is, is actually about something and tend to reach, you know, tens and tens and tens of millions of people. A film we made called Wonder would be a very good example of that, um, uh, which is just a film that we felt that was ultimately about compassion, and we feel that the conversation around compassion right now is a very important one. Um, uh, you know, under the, under the, the belief that we, we're not going to change the world if we don't like each other. Um, uh, um, so that would be the, sort of the first step. Is there a conversation to it, right? And if we all agree in the room, um, and there are six or seven executives who ultimately make a collective decision about it, then the next is, okay, if in fact it's more than just a conversation, right? And we believe that this is going to be one of those movies that can capture a zeitgeist moment, right? How, why do we believe that? How do we believe that? You know, what is it about this film that's going to capture? You know, you know, we didn't know that RBG would capture a moment. You know, that was that was fortuitous timing, quite honestly. We just believed that it was a very, very important movie to to engage in a conversation about. And so we talk a lot about the zeitgeist. We talk a lot about what people are thinking and what they're concerned about. So if it clicks that box, you know, then it's then it's got a really good chance of 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 uh, of uh, getting greenlit. And then last but not least, OK, who are the partners, right? Is there a viable, if, if in fact it captures the zeitgeist, are there organizations? Because you know, to somewhat repeat what Holly is saying is, we really see ourselves as, as, as contributors, right? There are these fantastic organizations who are out there, boots on the ground, out there working around an issue every single day. Um, uh, and what we're trying to do is partner with them in order to accelerate the change that they're bringing about. And so that's really the last one. Is are there pe people out there, are there organizations that have enough scale to really take what we believe this movie or this TV show will be about and take it to, to the level of, of, of true engagement around what we call action? Um, and then so that's kind of the, the current uh, um, uh, perspective on how we go about deciding about uh, the content that we make. Going forward, we what we really want to do is take it one step further, right? And because the life of a movie tends to be extremely short, and that you know it's a lot. It's a you know, you know. I used to work for GE, and so we would always talk. About, they would always talk about refrigerators, and I would say, but mm, my movie is not a refrigerator. Um, uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, um, but but it was it was an interesting corporate kind of uh, conversation because they were so into these long term assets and movies can be very short term assets. Um, but we'd like to begin to flip it a little bit. We'll continue to doing exactly what we do and doing it as well as as we can humanly possibly do it. But we'd also like to begin to extend the conversation further, right? And we've always been relatively singular in our approach, but we'd like it to be to be to to actually. Be, be involved with these organizations over a much longer period of time. And so that's going to be about adapting the, um, uh, our perspective around content to see if there are ways that we can extend the work that we're doing through multiple pieces of content. And um, one of the ways that I think is going to become increasingly important around documentaries is social media. Um, uh, because what you're beginning to see in social media communities is relatively robust communities in the sort of low millions, right? And you're beginning to see digital publishers, um, which are viable businesses that are speaking on a regular basis to 2 million, 4 million, 7 million, 13 million people. Um, uh, and these are actually real assets towards impact, right? Because for, for the big, you know, for foundations and NGOs and things like that, who have not really um, uh, 
um, you know, who don't speak so consistently to that level of people, I think there's a way of taking inspirational content that you, you know, around a movie and beginning to translate it into, um, uh, into the social media space past the life of the movie, right? So that you can actually create, so a campaign in and of itself becomes a piece of content, right? So you can imagine a world where you know, on, um, and we had some, some, we've had some, we've been, set, we had a very interesting, actually, um, experience recently where we made a movie 10 years ago called Food, Inc. And um, we have a Facebook community that was built up around Food, Inc. of, of about 2.1 million people who basically curate the page themselves, right? We haven't, we haven't been that engaged because we haven't really been, we, ha we haven't had, quite honestly, I haven't had the time to focus on social media yet, to be blunt. Um, uh, um, uh, but we're now getting to that place. We did a little sample the other day where we created three original pieces of content around, um, uh, uh, around the 10th anniversary of Food, Inc. And we got people who are actually on the Facebook community to talk about the effect of Food, Inc. on their, on their lives and their behavior and their families. We talked about you know, the famous chefs who, who, have, who are very engaged in the food space. And so with almost no media, behind, media spend behind it, we put these little three pieces out there, and we've had two million views of the pieces in the last, um, uh, in the last about, about three weeks, yeah, right? Last, yeah. About three weeks. So, and trust me, didn't cost anywhere a fraction of what a movie costs, right? But we engaged a community in, an, in a conversation about the importance of understanding what you're eating and the importance of understanding where food comes from for a relatively small amount of people, two million people like that, right? And increase the size of the food community by I think 6,000 people in a couple of weeks. And so that's exciting, right? And if we can find a way of connecting, taking what it is, you know, Food Inc. 10 years ago, food, 10th anniversary was this year, we're creating a continuity and then begin to engage the discussion around social media, then you're, then you're really doing something, right? Then you're, you're engaging. And it's a much fairer relationship with the uh, impact partners because you're not leaving them behind, right? right? And so you're actually creating a, a connected relationship that can go on for a really long period of time. And by the way, you know, so if Diane Weirman, who runs documentary film, if she can develop another idea around food, we've got millions of people that we're talking to already, right? Who can then, in fact, engage around another piece of original film or television content, so. In many ways, because of just what you're talking about, David, and the changes so um, transformatively across the media landscape, it, it's kind of a heyday for it. For an impact officer. Oh, I, mean, I feel as though so many I landed. Different ways in the, you, can, yes. you can have impact. Yes, I mean, I, I believe that we're at the precipice of 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 a, an era where, um, wh where the writing the story of our future, um, it's in our hands, and that we're really actually fighting for the narrative of what we want the world to be, what we want the nation to be, et cetera, and. At Participant, I feel as though um, we're sitting on the side of good, so that feels good. Um, and uh, peace and prosperity, or a, a, a more a sustainable world of peace and prosperity is our, um, our, 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 mantra. Worst, our, our mantra, more sustainable world of peace and prosperity. Um, but with uh, the ability to use digital tools, to connect across borders and time zones, and really to connect around an idea of shared values, the values and the vision of the future you want to see. It doesn't matter you, if you live in Atlanta or Decatur or Austin or Poughkeepsie, if you agree that RBG is an extraordinarily powerful, visible leader, you, that's, what you're, that's actually the narrative that you're um, rallying around, right? That this, this diminutive woman can lead, uh, can have this extraordinary life. And so our stories allow you to knit together with your brethren wherever they may live um, in a, I mean, I'm a very pacifist person, but when David was talking, it's like, yeah, we're building our food army, <laughs> you know? And I'm all about building the army. And, um, and, the, and I, I fundamentally believe that 
Um, the, uh, the folks who care deeply about food also care deeply about gender equity and also care deeply about sustainability in the environment. And that there, there's a subset of those people who are gonna get out of bed and march for it every day, but there's this massive missing middle. I mean, we're seeing this in politics, right? There are a subset who are on the hard, hard left and there's a subset of the, and somehow the middle got ignored and our films and our vision for the future that is one of, of um, of you know, positivity and compassion and courage is one that that missing middle can find a place in. Can we talk of taking that as the foundation, David? Can we talk a bit about the slate that's that's coming out now? Because this group of concerned and committed <laughs> citizens um, will be looking for participant films if they're not already, and hopefully they are, um, because they are known to be. Uh, fighting for or putting forward stories from that kind of world. What, wh what are they? Why are they participant films? And what are you expecting from them? Um, what am I expecting from them? <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, the question you should never answer. I'm uh, uh, just kidding. Um, no, well, we had, um, uh, I'll start with RBG, which obviously came out earlier in the year because it connects into something else that we're doing right now. But um, uh, um, so obviously RBG was a great success. We were very, very, um, uh, um, we were, you know, the, the level of engagement uh, that we had from communities around the country in wanting to see that movie um, and participate in the movie was um, uh, really, I think, uh, unprecedented. And we had, we partnered with, um, prior to the movie coming out, we partnered uh, with law firms, law schools, um, uh, uh, the ACLU, um, other organizations that are interested in the conversation of, or interested in, in the conversation that is engendered by um, the judge's career. And we had, I think, in total with our distributor, 125 theater buyouts um, before the movie actually came out. So literally, we filled 125 screens uh, of the movie with people, I think 85,000 people's, no, no, that's, I'm not sure, quite sure the numbers, but it um, uh, wasn't that money. But it, it really sparked the conversation in a, in a very, very legitimate way, and I'll get back to RBG in two seconds. Um, we're just about to complete a 10-part television series on stars called America to Me, um, uh, that is about, um, uh, well, the, the issue around it is really about you know, is the United States really committed to uh, to a true inclusive education, right? Um, for for everybody, I guess I'd say, and had the great pleasure of partnering with the Blank Foundation on a convening that we did in in um, in Atlanta. And I'll let Holly talk a little bit about America to me. Um, on November, late November 27th, I think, we're doing something we've never done before, um, uh, which is we made a documentary about an incredible. Um, Indian advocate by the name of Kailash Satyarthi, who uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize four years ago, I think, or five Malala. years ago, five, with the same year as Malala. Um, um, and Kailash has de dedicated his entire life to ending child slavery um, throughout the world. And with a focus in India, he's, he's Indian, and to date has saved the lives of 85,000 children in India. Um, and does it in a way that is, and, and, and not only saves the lives of these children, but then actually educates the one, educates them, uh, connects them back into their families, and it's a real amazing story of heroism. And our partner is YouTube on the movie, um, which is a, a, a di we've never partnered with YouTube on a movie before, but we made a conscious de decision that this was a movie that needed to be available to everybody. And part of the conversation with YouTube is that while a lot of their original films content is put behind, you know, is, is on what used to be called YouTube Red, but it's called something else now, Premium. they're actually putting it on, it's, it's gonna be free for the first four months. And, uh, and putting a big promotion behind it because we feel very, very strongly that this is an issue that people younger than me um, need to be conscious of and and, uh, and and really create dialogue around. Um, and Google are being big supporters of it and, and you'll, you'll see in the next couple of months that there's a there's a way that that in partnering with YouTube and Google we think we can be speci very, very specifically supportive of what Kailash is doing in India. 
Um, and then on November 21st, we have a wonderful movie. Um, of course, they're all wonderful. They're, <laughs> all my, my kids are great. They're my children. <laughs> um, uh, which just won the Audience Award at the Toronto Film Festival called Green Book, um, uh, which is uh, starring Mahershala Ali and Viggo Mortensen based upon a true story of of uh, a, um, some of you, some people may be familiar with him. There's a, an incredible pianist um, by the name of African American pianist named uh, Don Shirley, who was classically trained, and uh, um, but this the the story is set in the early '60s, um, uh, but uh, um, was essentially pushed to being uh, to focus on popular music, despite the fact that he was an incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, concert pianist. And he told his record company in the 1960s, it's based on a true story, that he wanted to tour the South by himself, uh, essentially. And as you've discussed, not to, give, not to tell the story of the, of the movie, but um, um, he had done it for a very specific reason, which is that he wanted to tour the South and show, and show the um, uh, white community in the South the great artistry uh, uh, that was coming out of the unexpected, I think, artistry that was coming out of this amazing African American artist, and so his record company said, "Sure, you can go, but you need to hire a driver and uh, who and would a bodyguard act, and a, who would actually act as your bodyguard." And he hired a guy named uh, Tony Villalonga, uh, who was the bouncer at the Copacabana. Um, uh, Tony the Lip, or Tony Lip, not the Lip, Tony Lip. And um, they embarked on this trip um, uh, and became fast friends. And uh, people who were coming from really opposite sides of the spectrum in terms of perspective of each other. And uh, it's a very, very heartwarming and emotional, you can hear it in my voice, story of two individuals who, you know, quite honestly, didn't expect to like each other, were kind of forced into the relationship and had a transformative event over the course of a few months of, of uh, driving through the, um, through the Deep South. Um, uh, and then on uh, next up, sorry, this, we have a lot going on this, this fall. Um, on uh, December 14th, there is the worldwide launch on Netflix of a movie directed by Alfonso Cuaron, who directed uh, Gravity and uh, Harry Potter movie and uh, Children of Men. Um, uh, uh, which won the Venice Film Festival a couple of weeks ago, um, which is a, um, uh, and I think an indicative of, of how artists are beginning to perceive participant in that um, he came, he brought the project to us despite the fact that he had the ability to set it up just about anywhere. And it's a reflection of, um, uh, he grew up in, in Mexico City almost the exact same age as me, so in the 60s and the 70s, and the movie is set in 1971, and it's a year in the life of his family, even though it's not, and, um, uh, and it's the year that uh, her, uh, her, uh, uh, their father left the family, um, and the family reformed itself around a relationship between the family and specifically their mother and their housekeeper and their nanny. Um, uh, and who is still living in the house in Mexico City. And he's completely, and it, it is, somebody asked me today, why is it a participant movie? And it's a participant movie because it's of extremely high quality and, and from, a fan, from an amazing artist. But it also relates back to RBG, right? Because right now we believe extremely strongly that the conversation around gender parity is a very, very important one. We also believe that storytelling cannot be limited to um, Americans and, and, and uh, white people, quite honestly. Um, and so it was an amazing opportunity for us to tell the story of an incredible woman who was the Quaron's housekeeper and her relationship with, uh, with the family. And, and it, was, it was an interesting, when we were in Venice, Alfonso was asked why, why, um, you know, how did this story come about? Because you're a man and you're telling the story of a woman, and he said, I, I felt that I had to tell the story because I, my relationship with uh, Libo, who was the housekeeper, was one of, you know, as a kid, I grew up with this woman who sort of took care of me, and it wasn't until I was an adult that I realized how important she was to me. 
So I had to go back and spend time with her so that I could understand her, right? Because my relationship with her had been as a young boy and the woman taking care of me, and I didn't understand her, right? And so he would never say this, so please don't, so I'm gonna say it sort of on the film's behalf, which is he's also, in, a, in addition to telling an incredible story about an incredible woman, he's also giving a face to a woman who would have otherwise not had a story. And that's what great storytelling is about. And then to, to wrap it up on, the, on gender parity and, and, um, uh, and RBG, we have another movie about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, we're doubling down on, on RBG uh, called On the Basis of Sex, uh, which unlike the documentary, which is, a, uh, which is really her career, uh, the, uh, the movie focuses on a specific event in her career before she was a judge. Um, uh, she had, as probably many of you know, she was, um, uh, she was first in her class at Harvard Law School, then transferred to Columbia, was not only first in her class at Columbia, she was the editor of the Law Review. Uh, she was married to actually a friend of my, my father-in-law's, um, uh, uh, Marty Ginsburg, who was a tax uh, law student. And they had this amazing relationship. And uh, they both walked out of law school together. And Marty got 16 job offers, and she got none. Um, uh, uh, and um, I have a funny story, actually. Um, uh, my father is a judge and a, and, uh, and a law professor, and so they, they intersected in, in, uh, in their professional lives. And I think Ruth is 85 years old. My dad is 94. And I was visiting. She came to set one day, and, and I introduced myself. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm Hans Lindy's son. And, and she said, oh, that's fantastic. She goes, how is Hans? He must be getting up there these days. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, uh, so, so you know, and, and all of these are very, you know, these are these are all important movies to us. But the story of On the Basis of Sex is the moment in time when Marty came home. She was teaching at, at Rutgers, or she was working at the ACLU, and uh, was very frustrated and angry because she was not being given the opportunity to be a lawyer, which is what she wanted to do. And uh, he threw down a brief on her on her desk, and she says, and it's in the movie, and it's a true story, she, she said, I don't read tax law. I don't like tax. It's boring. Um, uh, and he said, no, you should read this one. And um, the case was, and I hope I don't garble this for the lawyers in the room, um, was the case was about a gentleman who was a salesman in Denver, Colorado, who was the primary caregiver for his mother. Um, uh, and when he was traveling, he hired help, right, to uh, to uh, to take to to take care of his mother who was incapacitated. And um, as according to the tax code in the in the in the early 70s, you were able to if you were the primary caregiver, you were able to write off the uh, the cost of the caregiver on your taxes, and the IRS denied it when he uh, when he filed his tax return. Um, under the um, belief that no male could be in that position. As primary caregiver. As the primary yeah. caregiver. Yeah. Um, that it would be the role of the woman to be the primary caregiver. And so she realized that it was a case of um, reverse sexism, right? And that was really the case that, uh, that um, really began to change the way that the uh, laws around not just gender parity, but all, around all equality and parity um, began to change in the court system in the United States. She obviously won. Um, and that's sort of the thing that launched her career. And so the movie, the documentary is about her life. The movie is a love story, right? It's a love story between a man and a woman who had this incredible relationship that manifested itself um, uh, uh, through this case that she won. But it's about a hero, right? It's about a leader. It's about two leaders. It's about people who, who, who dug into something important that they believed in and changed the system. And uh, so that's why RBG, uh, Roma, which is the Quaron movie, and uh, On the Basis of Sex are all about a through line of having, about supporting an incredibly important conversation. So um, uh, that's Thank the, you for the coming attractions. Sorry, sorry. it's kind of long, but there's a lot of movies, so. <laughs> but it, but it's, uh, they're also the narrative that Jeff started. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why he did the company, is that those kinds of movies uh, could be made. So we got just two seconds for you with this room, with people who 
are interested in the subjects and the stories that participant tells, who have means and resources, contacts, organizations, knowledge, talent, all the things that are needed to take those great stories and put them into the hearts and minds of people in ways that change lives. So what, what would you ask of this group? Well, I'd ask, first of all, to get in touch with me. Um, if you're interested in um, uh, any of these films in terms of if you sit at a leverage point or if you think that um, your organization or your foundation um, would be interested in partnering with us around any of these um, projects, we just partnered with the Blank Foundation um, and um, uh, and a, a number of philanthropists and foundations across the country around uh, America to me, where local foundations matched our, um, you know, we made an enormous investment in the content, they matched at a local level, um, that investment to scale our reach and impact across their, um, their cities. Um, and so that's the sort of model that we're looking for. So we're looking for partners who share our vision, um, who have uh, resources um, and, um, you know, power um, wherever that sits within corporate world, within the government world. I have these nine areas of influence that I look at. But um, uh, to be partners with us um, on this work. And you'll be hearing um, from Anna and Molly about the, um, the, the grant that we're um, partnering on. Um, and that's certainly a, also a first step um, to learn more about this work. But I'm looking for collaborators, and I hope some of you um, will, will rise to that and um, lock arms with us and uh, share in, in, um, in telling the, 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 our, forward st our future story um, about peace and prosperity and compassion and courage. And if there's ever been a room that is empowered and ready to do that, I think it's this one. Would you join me in thanking Holly and David? Thank you. And I want to say how much we appreciate, again, this opportunity to not only hear more about participant, how its origin story, as well as what's coming ahead, but now the, the real opportunity the reason that we are here is that there is this unique partnership that has developed between the Blank Foundation and Participant Media. And Anna and Molly of Working Films are going to tell us more about that. And hopefully this will inspire more ideas in this room. So Molly and Anna, we'll turn it over to you now. So hi, everybody. My name is Anna Lee. And I'm Molly Murphy. Together, we co-direct a national nonprofit organization called Working Films. Working Films has used documentary film to advance social justice and environmental protection since 1999. As our name implies, we put documentaries to work. We make sure that those who are equipped to use media can do so for change. Um, sorry, I, this clicks, sorry. <laughs> Cool, so it was really a pleasure to hear from participant about your approach to change. Um, and now we're gonna take a few minutes to tell you about three examples of how we put documentary film to work to move the dial. Um, so we're gonna tell you about three different kinds of film projects that we've worked with. The first is a collection of short documentaries. The second is an episodic series with a pop culture connection. And the final one is a long form, more traditional documentary. But in each, you're gonna hear how specific organizations and foundations were able to achieve their goals by using the film. And we hope that when we finish up, you'll have a sense of how you can do the same. So, oh, oh. North Carolina is our home and the South is our region. And like I said, we work all over the United States. What you see here is 40,000 tons of coal ash spilled into the Dan River on the border of North Carolina and Virginia. Coal ash is what's left after coal burns. It's really toxic, but it's less regulated than the trash in your house. Uh, it's mostly stored in unlined pits um, that leak next to rivers. Um, this wasn't the first time coal ash spilled, and it wasn't the last. Environmental justice advocates and river keepers like Veronica and Kemp Pierre had some major challenges when this happened. First of all, nobody knew what coal ash was or 
mostly no one, like the residents here who didn't know if they could drink their water or take a bath. Also, our, sorry, I'm too happy with my clicker. Uh, our state legislature was also moving really fast. The governor at the time and many representatives had ties to Duke Power, who was responsible for this bill, and they were poised to really fast, really quickly push through a bill that wouldn't adequately protect communities. So a number of foundations stepped forward to basically tell the story. One of the foundations had an explicit commitment to protecting the environment, one to save water, um, and another to addressing inequities, because overwhelmingly coal ash is stored in low-income communities of color. So with their support, we created a series called Coal Ash Stories. It's a compilation of short films that explain what coal ash is and what communities who have been dealing with it are doing to advance solutions. We took the film to every directly impacted community and also every uh, major metropolitan area to mobilize, inform and mobilize residents to push for strong regulations. Our partners credit this series for a stronger bill passing and we've since taken this series to many more states because coal ash is not just a North Carolina problem. There's 378 coal burning power plants in the United States. They all produce waste. Uh, 30 of the waste facilities are here in Georgia. So we've taken what was a really successful campaign in North Carolina and brought it to many other states to mobilize residents to take action. Um, what we found with this series, which was our first time using a compilation of short films, uh, was that audiences overwhelmingly gained better understanding. They became motivated to act and take action and speak out um, to decision makers. And they became interested in being involved with our partner organizations. Uh, on top of that, it um, brought up the member and subscriber base of our, of our partner organizations. They saw like a rise. And through surveys that we had when people signed in, 75% of audiences weren't already involved with the host organization. So it was really reaching beyond the choir, which is something that we try to do. It also sparked new organizing where it didn't exist, new groups and organizations form that still exist today. And this happened in 2014. Um, and now residents are mobilized to act for the next time, and the next time just happened when Hurricane Florence hit the coast of North Carolina and caused coal ash to spill in our Cape Fear River. Since coal ash stories, we've led a variety of state campaign, statewide campaigns tackling a number of issues. Um, and you know, really using media to inform and mobilize residents to do something that matters. So our second case study is America Divided. Um, this was a documentary series uh, executive produced by Norman Lear, um, Shonda Rhimes, and hip hop artist Common. And it came out right in the um, lead up to the 2016 election. And unlike a lot of documentaries, um, it has this feature of having celebrity correspondents for each issue, and so uh, for each episode. And so in each one, um, a correspondent explored uh, inequality in one arena. So in public health, in public education, housing. And um, in all of them, there was a connection between that celebrity and the stories that they were telling. So um, many foundations um, funded this project, but particularly those with an interest in addressing inequality and in advancing racial justice. Um, and the Ford Foundation and W.K. Kellogg Foundation being two of those. And really believed in the power of these films to bridge divides, right? To show the connections across issues. And so they, uh, these organizations funded a national um, campaign and film series um, before these films and pre premiered on um, the Epix channel. And so Working Films came in to do, again, a targeted screening series in several different states. So I'm going to tell you about a couple of those. <laughs> oh, I think I skipped one. Oh. Hey, we're missing the clip, but we'll go to it in just a second. Um, so I'm getting ready to show you a clip that features Zach Galifianakis, who you probably, when you'll see him, you'll know him from the Hangover movies. Um, 
but you're gonna see a slightly different side of him than you normally would. So let's take a look at the clip. What are we looking at here? We are looking at a blow up of Cumberland County. This orange part is Senate 19 that used to be my district. Senate 21 used to be all in Cumberland County, all in this area. Now it is these white paint spatters. There's no rational reason for these arms that come out and stick out all over the place. And right here, this is my house. This funny little squiggle came down to pick me up and put me into the district I was not in before. Do you think they looked up your address? Oh, yes. They said, ah, Margaret Dixon, her address is, and there it is. There were a number of people who were taken out of the district in which they had run. This point here is where? Like, can you see it from your house? Like if this? we go outdoors, we can see. So we're walking on your new district right now, right? Yes, we are in my new district, Senate 21. My neighbors across the street are in Senate 19, my old district. You stay there. OK, we can wait. I'll stay here. Oh, it's so much better over here, Margaret. Oh, no, no, no. Senate 21. Ah. Hello from Senate 21. People feel like they've lost control of the process. And in some ways, they have. The redistricting is being done by people far away. The advertising is being produced and paid for by people far away, people we will never know. I wish we could go back to the time when the voters chose their legislators instead of legislators choosing their voters through the redistricting process. How hopeful are you that we could get back to that? I think the pendulum will swing back, but it's a question of how long that takes and in my view, how much, is, how much damage is done between now and then. Okay, so as the rest of the film unfolds, you see Zach travel around North Carolina and look at the ways that dark money has really influenced all aspects of life in the state, um, from ultimately policies that undermine social safety net um, in the state, and education funding to the gerrymandering that you see happening here. So um, in early 2017, we knew that the moment was ripe to bring this film out into communities um, because it was a point in time when people who had never been active before were ready to join social movements, but they didn't know what to do. They didn't know how to connect. And we knew that this film, which has you know, a little bit of humor, um, crosses issue silos through this connection around the issue of money and politics, um, was a great way to turn people out. But honestly, it exceeded even our wildest expectations. We initially brought the film to 30 locations in North Carolina. Um, and that ranged from the largest cities to the smallest towns. Um, in fact, in one location, we turned out a quarter of a town's population to screening. Um, so it definitely resonated. And ultimately, thousands of people across the state saw the film. But really, the most important question is then, what did they do? It's great that they were there, but what happened? Um, well, what we know is that we brought more people into the moral movement. Many of you might be familiar with Reverend Barber in the upper right here, um, was, the leader of the was the leader of the North Carolina NAACP, um, and sp uh, spearheaded the, the multi-issue movement, uh, moral movement. And we know uh, that our, at our screenings, we turned people out to the upcoming moral march they were having uh, on the state capitol. We sold bus tickets and had information about how to get there. Or not we did, our partner organizations did that. Um, and uh, we also know from our, the many partners that we worked with that we, again, increased their membership, had new constituents for them. Uh, we partnered with over, with over 58 organizations on this initial set of screenings. Um, but also, in addition to those established groups, worked with just small groups of individuals who said, I want this to come to my town. I'll have this, I'll set up this screening. And it sparked, again, new organizing. Um, and we finished up the, the tour with a screening in Wilkesboro, which is a, um, one of the reddest districts in North Carolina. And 
uh, over 500 people came out and feel like it's really just like a testament to how the content of these films resonated with people across the political spectrum and gave people a chance to come into community with one another and dialogue. And um, so we also worked with one of the other films in the series called Out of Reach, which this one features America Ferreira who has her own immigration story, and she goes to Texas to explore the impact of immigration policies on families there. And again, this was filmed in, um, in 2016, and um, we then worked with organizations in Texas, specifically the National Domestic Workers Alliance and a group called Raices, um, to set up 12 different screenings across the state. And we brought the film to kind of two different kinds of communities. First, we brought it um, two communities that were largely um, immigrant populations and immigrant families. We also, though, wanted to bring it to people who didn't have that lived experience, for whom um, this might be something they knew about on the news, but this wasn't their day to day. And our goal was to help people have a more nuanced understanding of what's a complex system, right? We hear people talk about immigration all the time, but really to know on a personal level, as you see this film, how this impacts people. Um, and this was really critical at the time because there was a piece of legislation in the Texas state legislature um, being considered the SB4, which a lot of people called a show me your papers law. Um, and that was gonna it would require a lot closer collaboration um, between federal immigration enforcement and local law enforcement. And so it was a hot topic and really a need for increased dialogue um, and education around these issues. Um, and so we heard from, again, from our partner organizations who hosted the screenings, um, that there were aha moments, right? People who said, wow, I didn't know this was happening next door to me. Like, I didn't understand. And they knew that because in addition to this, the film screening, after the screenings, we would have immigration lawyers, people who are DACA recipients, people, again, directly affected to add to the story. And then we also heard from folks, we screened this in like community centers and what are predominantly immigrant neighborhoods, of folks who said, this was so important for me to see my experience reflected on screen, right? Too often, my story is not being told, and it was powerful to be able to have that space to dialogue and share my own story after seeing it reflected. So ultimately, you know, this series is called America Divided, but we found so much success in it truly actually bringing people together to dialogue and then most importantly to take action. So Catching the Sun is a film that follows workers and entrepreneurs in the race to a clean energy future. And it asks the question, can the United States transition to a clean energy economy that works for everyone? We'll show you a clip. Goes here. Yeah, that's the first time we're gonna lay. Okay. I actually just got full time. I luckily interviewed with this company first. I sent me an email and they called me back in like 30 minutes. I had a job the next day. Well, all the panels are connected to each other. Then it sends through the J box from the J box, it travels to the inverter. Boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> I like installing in, in neighborhoods I'm familiar with and that I grew up in and where I got family and friends. I actually installed these solar panels right up here. While I'm at work, I'm seeing people I know. And they looking like, man, what you doing? I'm working, man. <laughs> After a while, I found myself making trips to come see him outside of class. Just kind of uh, gradually moved in. <laughs> I want to provide a good situation for my girlfriend, my future family. With this career, I could be a project manager, engineer. I could help design systems. I hope to seize all of those opportunities.
So with the support of many foundations and really through the hard work of the filmmaker who made this over the course of almost a decade and we consulted with her through the process, we launched the Suncatcher campaign. Uh, we partnered with clean tech entrepreneurs, solar companies, grassroots organizations and nonprofits to tour the film in 25 states. Um, in a total of, I think it was 86 screenings, all in places with tipping point potential for solar friendly policies. And what we wanted to do was involve audiences basically in the push for clean power and to elevate awareness and real demand for affordable clean energy and green jobs. Um, Our partners say that what Catching the Sun did was really to bring disparate sectors together around a shared vision um, and also help to elevate an understanding that to transition to clean energy, we really have to transform to a more equitable economy. So you've heard a little bit about our impact work, but in addition to that, we do training. Um, we help other people, filmmakers and other filmmakers and other organizations um, to understand our methodologies and to learn more about how they can use film for change. Um, so we are super excited tonight to announce um, the launch of a new training institute for Georgia organizations called Putting Films to Work. And so it's really um, thanks to the Arthur and Blank Family Foundation and Participant Media who are giving us seed funding to get this opportunity started. So just if y'all give them a round of applause. So um, eight Georgia organizations will be selected and have the opportunity to spend next year with us um, really learning how to use film and how to put it to work. So just so you know, who can apply? Um, basically, any 501c3 organization in Georgia that has a fo focus on social, racial, or economic justice is welcome to apply to the program. So then, though, what are we going to do with them more specifically? Um, these are our broad goals for the work. First and foremost, we want to have this group of organizations and, by extension, their networks and colleagues and members understand that documentary film can be an integral part of their work. It's not some bonus thing you just do for like an extra event. It really can move the dial on your issue. So we want them to walk away knowing that. And we'll do that by hosting an initial two-day tr like, um, training institute where they'll learn more about the kind of stories that we shared tonight, about how to put film to work on online um, spaces, and also how to incorporate into their own trainings and workshops and more internal um, events. Secondly, we hope that we will um, reach more people in Georgia who you know, want to know about and need to know about these issues. And we'll do that not by really offering mentorship to those participating organizations as they actually roll out film events next year. So we're not just going to do a training and say, oh, now you're on your own, figure it out. We're going to mentor them as they each put on multiple film events over the course of the year and offer them support for the cost and expenses to do that. We haven't talked about that tonight, but you know, filmmakers get paid screening rates for the use of their films, so we're going to support that and support them with costs for the events themselves. And then finally, we hope that our work with these folks and our broader work will contribute to a shift towards more accountable and community-led story. We talked a little bit tonight about folks seeing ourselves on screen, right? And we at Working Films have been working with a group of um, both media makers and activists and organizers around a set of principles and praxis to guide storytelling that's really an accountable to the communities featured in the film, that involves them in dialogue, not only as the film is being made, but as it continues to be out in the world. So we're looking forward to bringing that conversation to this group of organizations, and also hopefully to the larger media landscape in Georgia. Um, as it so rightly pointed out, um, there's a great opportunity to extend that conversation beyond just the, the group that we're working with. Yeah, for sure. Um, so to find out more about the Training Institute, you can go to puttingfilmstowork.org. You can also find the application there. 
Um, and right now, we're really happy to answer any questions that you have about the Training Institute or about anything that we've shared. I want to thank Working Films, and also, since we've got a few minutes for questions, um, Holly and David are, are fair game, too. Yeah, um, <laughs> you're not up there. It's a short walk for them back up to the stage. <laughs> we've got a couple of mics here. If you could approach a mic and just introduce yourself to ask a question. Yeah. It'll be up to Pat whether she wants to answer or not. <laughs> she may or may not want to. Hi, my name is Wendy Ely Jackson. I'm with Auburn Avenue Films. My question is actually for working films. Would you prefer that the filmmaker involve you during the creative process to help with the campaign, or are you looking to do work with films midway through? What's your entry point for the filmmaker? Yeah, so um, our work uh, is primarily rooted in the work of organizers and movements, and we really are, respond to their needs. We've always said we put movies in service of movements, so really the priorities of the organizations is what will direct the content that we're looking for. On some of the topics that we're working on, we do need works in progress. Um, and you know, depending on where it is in the process of the training institute would probably dictate what we're willing to entertain in terms of content that's not done yet. Um, you talked about long haul relationships with organizations and that's something that we try to foster throughout the production process with organizations. So we'd definitely be open to paying attention to um, content that's coming that's aligned with the organizations participating in the institute. And I'll just say to add to that, I think generally around, um, you know, starting to think about impact and plan that work. Um, I think even as you know, you all are talking, it's from the as the film is being made, right? If it is essential to be beginning to reflect on that and start the planning for how it will be used as the film is is being created. Actually, follow up question. <laughs> Um, so, we we do uh, just organizers like working films um, can do some individual uh, filmmaker like consultation. Um, we do, we're doing less of that and more of these the sort of thematic content that we talked about in, in the first project. Um, so happy to talk to you offline about like really specific details, um, and also happy to just yeah share. But um, it really varies kind of case by case. Um, on available resources, so. Yeah, and we see just the Training Institute will serve filmmakers in the sense that those who participate and organizations that are kind of in the ecosystem, what we wanna do is help build their you know, receptivity and embrace of documentary and their skill set and using it as an asset in their work so that they are more open to finding documentaries and using them and knowing how, which ultimately will serve filmmakers um, whose films can be better put to work. I'm going to ask a question that, go ahead, while he's getting to the mic, that I think our chairman might ask for Holly and for you guys. Uh, what's an example of an uh, impact campaign that went bust and did not work, and what did you take away from it? Because we've heard lots about things that did work. Um, my guess is you might have had a failure along the way. Uh, uh, what do you want to is that, I thought that was a question oh, for Holly. <laughs> 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 I think that um, I think that you know we talked a little bit of the green light process at participant, um, but but I didn't really talk about what you look for in an impact campaign to decide whether or not a film um, merits an impact campaign because not every film does, um, and um, so we look for. David talked about some of this. Is the issue timely? That's both on both sides. Does it um, address an issue that's really big? Um, how does the content leave you feeling? Does it leave you feeling, um, do, does it leave you with an activist emotion? And activist emotions are um, inspiration, hope, possibility, a connection to something bigger than yourself, or anger and outrage. But like a gentle one, like compassion, not an act, that's not an activating emotion. So when you're building an impact campaign, it's really important to think about where the film leaves you. Um, and another, I won't go through all the components, but another one, these are the ones that sometimes lead to the bust. Um, 
Uh, another one is agency. So there may, so well, clarity and agency. So is the issue that's tackled in the film very clear? Do you know what it is that you're supposed to do when you leave the um, theater? Um, and do, is there agency for the everyday person? So you're not left frustrated because actually you're so disconnected that, or that the, the you know only that there's no actual agency for an individual. And so the 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 example that's been on my brain is actually not a participant movie. It's not what even a movie. But how many of you remember Coney 2012? Mm. Mm -hmm. So Coney 2012 was a really good example of uh, of a of a of a story that went viral. Um, it was about the Ugandan dictator who was using child soldiers. Um, it went viral, but unfortunately there was a disconnect between the scale of the message and the agency of individuals. And if you remember, I watched that one really carefully because it was early in the Girl Rising days, and I thought, oh, this is what you want. You want something to go viral. But actually it collapsed in on itself because the, the makers didn't know what to ask all these people to do. And if you remember, over the course of the week that it went crazy, millions and millions of people, they said, oh, wake up at, on a Saturday, over Saturday night, wallpaper your town or something <laughs> about, about this issue of this Ugandan dictator, when in fact, you know, the people who needed to be, there were like three people in the Senate for whom could, who could actually make a difference. So, you know, who has agency is important. So I would say, um, as you're thinking about um, campaigns, um, the ones that went bust are the ones that sort of, there's no clarity, the issue's not big enough, there's a lack of clear agency, those kinds of things are the, are, are, are the failures. Mm -hmm. That's great, question. Thank you, John. And Dwayne Marshall with the Southeastern Council of Foundations. And first of all, John, I just want to thank and acknowledge you and Penny and the Blank Foundation family for hosting this phenomenal conversation. Mm. It's really rich. Uh, my initial question is for Molly and Anna, and then I have a question for, for David and Holly, if I may, as well. Uh, my question for you, Molly and Anna, is I'm very excited about the Putting Films to Work Training Institute and obviously Blank as a local funder leaning into it. But as Kenny mentioned in his initial remarks, uh, George is now the home or the largest market for film production in the country. Is there any strategy or opportunity to ask some of those film production companies that are bringing talent and resources to the state to also possibly lean in and invest in the Training Institute and what it's looking to accomplish? Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> Can we bring you to our funder meeting? Sure. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, just particular ask, um, and I'm. I think that I said this, but um, yeah, for anyone with the foundation in the room, um, we definitely want you to spread the word to your grantees and encourage them to apply. We're also looking for partners. Um, we're looking, seeking more support from foundations. We also do want to partner with filmmakers and um, those in the film industry. Um, and so plan on uh, definitely maximizing the robust uh, infrastructure here in Georgia. And then, um, yeah, are, are, are looking at whom we can partner with. So please talk to us, visit the website, be in contact. We'll also be hosting a webinar um, very soon, and we'll announce it via our social media and blog and on this puttingfilmstowork.org page so that you can find out more about the Training Institute and also just reach out to us about partnerships. Before you ask your second sure. question, to all the funders here and those that you know, the, the safest best investment you'll ever make is to follow Jeff Skoll and Arthur Blank. <coughs> and Jeff Skoll and Arthur Blank are smart enough not to have funded 100% of it. It's going to take a few more folks to get to the finish line. And there are limited opportunities left <laughs> to be on the ground floor of this. Um, and we already are getting calls from national funders who would like to see other cities mm -hmm. do this. But Atlanta is going to be first, and so we do want you to join in. So your second question. Yeah, very brief, and it's for David and Holly on the participant media side. Being that we're in a room of other foundations and nonprofits, how often is it where foundations who obviously are very passionate about very specific issues actually come to you with an idea and a concept, as well as possibly resources to co-invest in a film or documentary project? Josh, you got it. Me. How many days a week do they hand your scripts, David? <laughs> Not very many. Um, uh, you know, it's it's part of our um, uh, the DNA of the company that we've been doing this for so long that we have a very robust development slate of material. Right? 
And in most cases, we're very, very um, reliant on the perspective of the artist, right? Mm -hmm. And so we rarely uh, develop anything in, in the narrative um, space. We rarely um, uh, um, uh, uh, develop anything that doesn't bring in it with it the, the either a, a, a screenwriter who has a very, very strong uh, sense of what it is that he's trying to accomplish with us or a director or a producer. So, you know, that, that's just kind of our process. And as a result, when we're brought scripts, it's hard for us to integrate into, because, you know, we, we, we need to take a certain amount of development swings in order to make a certain amount of movies. And so the reality is it's hard to fit in, right, um, into that. So, um, um, you know, we're, with that said, we consider just about anything that comes in. Um, but I would say that if something comes into us from somebody else, the likelihood of us wanting to put our stamp on it, right, and, and sort of integrate the kinds of artists and filmmakers that we uh, traditionally work with is pretty strong. Right? So I, don't know, I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Question. Hi, I'm Bill Bowling, and I've worked with food all my life as a transformational tool. Uh, David, I think you gave the example, but for any of you to answer this, you talked about the future uh, being in part around social media mm -hmm. and engaging people, how that virals out. You use Food Inc. as an example. I'm very, very familiar with that and, you know, with that whole community that was created around that over the last 10 years. But can you say more about um, what that engagement is? I mean, what, what would participant media do with a group that did form around a movie and an issue Social media was created, you know, there's people tracking, but then what do we do together? How do, how do we leverage that? Oh, you want me to do that? Sure. Okay, so um, I th we're really developing um, what that looks like, um, but the way we're thinking about it is that um, social media is a connective force, but activation comes at the community level. So how can we create frames for people to work with at a community level? So I'll give you actually an example around RBG, um, uh, which is that um, when David talked about those theater buyouts, what was happening in each one of those buyouts was actually really important. It was what we said to law firms is that we know, not in these words, we know that you often have a pipeline problem. You've got too many male partners, not enough female partners. We also know that you do a ton of pro bono work um, around issues of gender in your community. Why not use RBG as an opportunity to highlight your firm's commitment to adding females to your leadership and to highlight the work you're already doing or announce a new um, program that you're doing in your community. Um, we'll give you sample run of show, we'll give you sample po talking points, we'll give you some backstory on the film, we'll give you marketing materials for your, lo for your theater lobby, we'll inspire you with lace justice collars that you can buy from Etsy. Um, and so what happens is that the magic comes and then we spread that across social media. So we, yes, we did some hand-to-hand -hand combat with reaching out to companies and law firms who we thought we were, who were, you know, vision aligned. But we also reached out to community organizers in Boston, Chicago, and San Francisco and said, you know, fill theaters and celebrate gender equity. This is a celebration. Wear your RBG t t uh, shirts, wear your hats from the, the march. And we, we like turned out the vote. And so that's how social media allows you to find your super fans and then creativity allows you to activate those super fans and get them to um, make it a moment in their own community. So that's the, the you provide the materials, you provide the frame often, um, you know, it's so exciting to be doing this work with Working Films because Working Films is actually coming, we're coming from the sort of uh, top down, if you will, mass scale into community. Working Films is looking into the community and saying, what are the needs and how can we pull from the top um, and bring the content, which frankly, you know, the amazing thing about content is that it hits you and you and you, if we watch a piece of content together, we're immediately bonded. Right, so it has this amazing transformational effect that is an accelerator and it's a catalyst. But it's that it only like yeast 
that's not a great thing, but yeah, <laughs> but like yeast, it's yeast is catalytic, but if the environment's not right, it dies. And so you want to basically put your content into an environment that can then let it blossom. I think you've given us the hashtag for yeah. I, I hashtag think also, yeast. I think also, <laughs> I'm raising my hand again, but I, I, think, I think also regarding food, you know, which was your your specific interest is what we're trying to do is to create scale, mm -hmm. right? And it's not necessarily scale for us, right? We'd love to have a bunch of people who identify with participant who are also interested in food, right? But we're really trying to create a plat essentially a platform knowing that in, the, in, the, in, in, in that issue area, a couple million people is a lot of people, right? Mm -hmm. Talking to each other. And so really, at, in the beginning, what we're really trying to do is to create engagement, mm -hmm. right? Engagement that results in other engagement. And we have to be incredibly careful about, you know, about what it is that we're curating to that audience. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, what we'd like to do is create a rhythm and a cadence to the kind of material that's being offered. So it's of a value to them, so they spend more and more time on the site, so that other people who are interested in the, in the, in the issue can come to the platform and begin to, and we can actually, to a certain extent, become the curator as opposed to the producer. And that's what I mean by le leveraging Jeff's money, because the perfect scenario would be we build it up to four million people, right? And other people, other food advocates can come to the platform and say, hey, I've got a great series, and I'm going to be able to finance my great digital series because your platform exists, because I know that I can reach four million, up to four million people. I think we're looking for that. Yeah, great. Well, that's good. That's why I have your card. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you're going to have the last question of the evening. Oh, Go ahead. you were waiting to ask a question, right? <laughs> we'll do two. Okay. Go ahead. I spent a day with your colleague about two weeks ago, whenever before the hurricane, which by the way, we were just hit by a hurricane, <laughs> and, and I just got power day before yesterday. <laughs> um, but uh, in an all day meeting about using a documentary film uh, in, in support of organizing and Georgia public broadcasting, I was just really impressed by the approach and the commitment to community engagement with documentary, and we would love to talk to you about, about partnering in this work. <laughs> I know the feeling. Thank you, Taya. All right. Go ahead. I think this will be a good last question. My name is Martise Sutton, and I'm the founder of Girls Going Global. We take low-income girls on international education and service learning opportunities. And so I know this is an awesome opportunity, but it's limited. You know, you're selecting eight. And so I would love to know from any of you, you know, with small grassroots organizations, what are one to three steps or resources that we should be doing to get our message out there if we can't, you know, participate in, you know, these awesome experiences or get like a major, you know, media company behind us, what are things that we should be doing that we can get our message out there now? Uh, well, or not now, long term. Great <laughs> um, well, a couple of things come to mind. So, you know, we work mostly with existing content um, for at Working Films. So one thing I would offer to you is just um, look at the, you know, do a, a sort of scan of like what is out there that is on you know the topics that you work on and think about oh man could we like start to use like a little clip of this you know this film in our work or could we do a screening that connects this larger story that may not be about exactly about our work but we can make that tie right after the film wraps up and you have that space so that's one thing i would offer in terms of kind of creating content for yourself, which I think is maybe a little bit like more of the direction. I wanted to do a documentary. <laughs> of your question. <laughs> um, you know, 
I think that there are often so many resources, especially in a place like Atlanta, of um, you know student filmmakers who have internships and opportunities where they want you know need to make content and might want to partner with organizations. I know at the university in Wilmington, there's an ongoing partnership between the film department and um, a center for entrepreneurship that matches nonprofits and student filmmakers to create you know needed content and. Um, so looking for some, and I don't know those opportunities specifically here, but I would imagine you know similar things might exist. Um, and then I think as you're thinking about like, you know, getting involved in creating some of your own content, um, just we've been having a lot of conversations lately with creators who kind of work in that space of, of partnering with nonprofits, is to just have sit down and have really clear conversations. You know, if you've identified some resources that might be able to make that happen about what you're looking for and what they're able to provide, because sometimes those things could be <laughs> a bit at um, there some tensions there, but to just have clarity about, we want to tell a story really about the issue, about the people about that we work with. Um, I think those are often most compelling. Um, so I'll offer that. Anyone else is yeah. to weigh in? Can I ask one? Yeah. Uh, on Fire away. You got an answer for her? Yeah, kind of in a roundabout sort of way. Well, um, I think I can come in. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Maynard Jackson III um, with Auburn Avenue Films. And um, first of all, I'm just like so happy to see the partnership between Participant and Cox Curry. Cox Curry is our, um, our fiscal agent for uh, the Maynard documentary. We, well, let me back up. Thank you. <laughs> now, one thing I wouldn't have been able to do this film without, and that's for sure, it's uh, Wendy. So I know everybody doesn't have a Wendy Ely Jackson in their life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so for, uh, <laughs> so um, maybe you could answer, like, so for the people that don't have a Wendy in their life, and, and you know, so if, if I was just trying to make a film about my dad and, um, you know, like she said, didn't have access to, you know, this kind of access. Um, and, and I, I kind of almost, I got the answer from David, and I'm just trying to um, kind of fill in a few blanks, because um, the way he explained was if you have a, um, you know, a, a, like a purpose-driven focus, and you kind of just go out and do the, the legwork on it, and you can kind of build this, this, um, this movement around it, and that's kind of the idea I had in mind about doing a documentary on my dad. Just wanting to um, re, re um, ignite, you know, more like illuminate the things that he did, um, especially um, the importance of it in this day and time. So um, with a, a movement like that, it's it's like it's it's easy to see how you can get the. Um, the, uh, the, the the swell, so to speak, uh, um, of support behind it. So, to um, just to, to kind of bring it bring it around. Um, wh what I'm saying is like, if I had been able to have access to to a participant when when I had this idea, I can't imagine. Um, well, there are yeah. there are a number of training institutes that you might seek out just for support and mentorship. One is the Southern Documentary Fund, which works with people who want to tell stories that are in maybe less resource areas like the South and maybe you know not in New York or Los Angeles or San Francisco. So Southern Documentary Fund is definitely an entity to, to check out. And also Firelight Media, which pro provides mentorship and a lot of support for first-time filmmakers of color. So that would be some advice just as you get rolling of um, organizations and institutions that invest in first-time storytellers. Thank you. Dave, Jens, could you put the website back up and we'll end with your assignment, which is if you're a nonprofit interested in applying, mm -hmm. go there and apply. If you are a funder or a friend of a nonprofit you want to nominate, be sure to share the link with them. I just, would, just, to, just to add to, to what you were saying is, there's a very interesting organization called Doc Society, which used to be called Brit Doc. And I think one of the interesting things about um, what Wendy did on, on the, the documentary about Maynard was that she took a, and, you know, and I just met Wendy this morning, so if you could please feel to interrupt me if, if I'm, if I'm uh, 
if I'm uh, articulating this incorrectly. But one of the things that she did is that she approached it very much from a perspective of creating a terrific piece of content, but also what would the impact be, right? And that is actually a business, right? You're seeing it with working films here. And Doc Society are real leaders in the, in the space. Um, uh, and what they've done, if you go to their website, what they've done is they actually show how you can create impactful um, documentary film, right? And they and they sh and they have um, uh, uh, sessions around the world where, which are essentially pitch sessions, which attract producers, filmmakers, financiers, all sorts of people. Um, and that's just one of examples. And, and you were just men mentioning a couple of local examples, but there's all sorts of fantastic organizations. You know, Film Independent in Los Angeles. Uh, the Independent feature, feature Project in New York comes to mind, Brit Doc, who have actually begun to kind of um, uh, uh, almost systematize the way of making, you know, impactful, relatively low budget, um, independent stories, right? And, and it's, just, it's just a matter of like, you know, Google Independent Film Project, what else comes up, right? And you'll find there's a lot of these organizations all around the world that are becoming significantly more supportive and engaged because they've they've created sort of a system to their approach to, to supporting people. Thank you to Participant Media and Working Films, and thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you.